I'm Sonia Azad. Welcome to The Shift, a place to inspire growth, resilience, and wisdom, real connection, healthy conversation as we navigate life's changes and challenges together. Because as I like to say, we are all each other's teachers. Thanks to our friends at the center for making our podcast possible. I'm Sonia Zad. Welcome to The Shift. I'm at Dallas Irby with my friend, Eddie Nahara. You go by Eddie, Eduardo. Whatever you feel comfortable with. Oh, I have other choice <laughs> names. We could use those. I'm just kidding. They're all good. Nicknames? Okay, I, I want to hear that. <laughs> uh, how are you? I'm great. Yeah? Great, you know, struggling with health the last couple of years, but um, finally I did a procedure on my back that worked. Yeah, we, yeah we've talked a little bit about this. Um, something I've started doing is asking people, how are you doing in one word, but you have to give an honest answer. It's like a one word check-in. I do this with a lot of my yoga students. So what would one word for how you're feeling be right now? At peace. Yeah, I like that. That's good. That's great. Um, your physical health is on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being best, where at this point? Physical health is about a 6. Okay. That's decent. I think that my brain is... I'm a little tougher than most, so my pain tolerance is is high or low. Which one is it? <laughs> Your pain tolerance is high. Yeah. Uh, so meaning that I can tolerate pain more than physical pain. Yeah. Emotional pain, I struggle just like the rest. <laughs> but physical <laughs> pain, I uh, you know, my brain was wired since I was in college to tolerate pain, play through it, and bounce back, and you know. So I think that my body's feeling about a six. Could be worse, could definitely be better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've had a, a couple of procedures done in the last several, like six, eight, ten months. Since we met. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a hip replacement and three back surgeries, two hip surgeries, one big one, hip replacement, and the three back surgeries in the last 18 months. I don't think people realize like how tough you've been on your body for so long. And at some point the body's like, I, just, I that's all I got. That's all I got. Well, that's when I retire from what I love the most and what I know since I was a kid. Uh, as soon as my body starts sending signals, uh, whether it was a knee, the hip, the back, uh, my, my brain was still operating at a high level, but the body just wouldn't follow. And again, that toughness that I was referring to, when I couldn't do the preparation before I get to the training camp, and talk about basketball terminology, a training camp usually is in October, and that's when I decided to walk away. My body was not responding, my brain was still going, and, you know, one day I was training in the track. So doing my normal routine, sprinting, what worked for me for 12 years. Then my left knee got swollen just by doing the, the sprinting and drained the fluid. Obviously went to the doctor, he drained the fluid, came back in three days and the other knee blew out. Did the same thing, then my back started hurting. And my hip, and I was like, you know what? It's not worth it. I love my body too much, and it was telling me that it needed a break. Um, so this podcast is called The Shift, <clears throat> and I haven't told you this yet. You actually inspired this, the whole thing, because of the conversation initially that we had about you shifting from the NBA to retirement and taking yourself through that process. Um, and after our conversation for months, I thought people don't really hear about all the shit that we all go through. They see the highlight reel, right? So all these accolades, 
all these smiles, all these vacations, all these, you know, awards and it's the other stuff that they don't all see. All the social media content. Oh, yeah. All the social media content, you know, some I'm of which yet, can be I'm helpful. I'm still yet to see uh, a struggle uh, through social media. It's, it's usually, uh, you know, the rainbows and unicorns and you yeah. see the good, the good, basically. But yeah, uh, and thank you for sharing that, the shift. I mean, there are multiple shifts, not only after retirement, even prior, I came to uh, to this beautiful country. Um, there has been so many. So, which one do you want to talk I about? I know. <laughs> Where should we start? The shift as an immigrant, the shift into pro athletes, the shift out of pro athletes. M many people don't know you have a 500-hour yoga teacher training certification. The shift into becoming connected to your mind and your body in a totally different way and that relationship it really took me a while to get to that level it doesn't again uh, you go through so many obstacles failures in your professional life also your emotional life uh, family there's so many things that happen in within you but if i have to concentrate i mean the, the shift from being an immigrant, I mean, that that's where it all started. I mean, although it builds character, but it was a big sacrifice that I made leaving my family, brothers, sisters, friends, city, a community, the state, my culture, which is Mexico, and coming to learn about a different country, language, culture, food, everything was was uh, it was really tough, even though even though there was great times, there was a lot of lonely times. There was a lot of struggles. Not speaking English was one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, now I want my kids to go through that. I think, it, like I said, it builds character and it kind kind of uh, guides you later in life. Now, I was, I was fortunate enough to to fall in love with the game of basketball at, at a young age. And same thing, lots of shifts throughout my career, but the biggest was retirement. When you do something that you love doing and you're really good at it for such a long time, and then it disappears. <laughs> and all the uh, glamorous lifestyle, all the private planes, all the uh, catering that the Mavericks, the Nuggets, the Nets, the Hornets, Golden State presented is gone. And now you're back to reality. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be humble throughout my career, so that helped a little bit, but I still struggle a lot during that shift. Because when you don't have the attention, when you don't have basically everything that that you work for is, is, is rough. And then you start figuring out, how many friends do I have? Now I'm from another country, and I'm lucky, uh, lucky I, I grew up in the city of Dallas, came here in 2000. And I mean, I can count my friends with one hand, mm. close friends. I have a lot of acquaintances, of course, mm -hmm. but somebody that I can rely on. Uh, and when you go through those struggles, I mean, you can. I went through depression, not knowing what's next. Obviously, uh, my career gave me a lot, so financially stability is one of them. But still, though, it doesn't give you uh, fulfillment. So now that I can't play, what is it that I need to concentrate in my life? And I was all over the place mentally, emotionally, physically. So finally, I found uh, yoga. Uh, and that was right after my divorce. <laughs> I needed a community. I needed to interact with other humans. And I needed it to be a healthy environment. And one of my friends, dear friends, that is part of my circle is the one that owns some uh, yoga studios. And he kept asking me, you need to come, you need to come. And uh, my stubbornness, I'm an athlete. I'm, 
I'm a, I'm a runner, I, I like lifting weights, I like all these hardcore, hardcore exercises. But finally I said, I committed, I was like, okay, I'll come one time, and I loved it. Since the moment I walked in, I felt safe. I felt like I walked into a different sanctuary that was not a basketball court. Mm -hmm. And I felt welcome. So that really helped me get through my, my uh, emotional struggles. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you think it is about the practice? Is it the slowing down? Is it feeling your body in a different way, kind of um, in a more tender way, instead of being so rough with it? Or is it something else, the breath or the freedom of movement that helped you? It took me a while to understand what it was. Yeah. Uh, at first, it was obviously physical activity that was not hurting my body, yeah. and it felt good. But after a while, it was literally, I started kind of digging in, like, why do I love it so much? But I started, I don't know if that's the right word to use, because it seems like I was programmed since I was, especially in college. So I had the influence of my coaches, multiple coaches, teammates, and I saw life differently differently than everybody else. So fear was the biggest motivator. Hmm. Uh, and that program in college that my college coach placed into my brain hmm. was really hard to let go. And being afraid of um, failure was was kind of the reason I make me work harder so I don't let down my teammates, my coaches, the city, and all of that. But at the same time, I was hurting myself. It's not enough, and suck it up. It's all in me, no problem. Keep running, keep moving forward. So I started hurting my body more so than anything. So when I got to yoga, it was really hard for me to let go. And the same with the emotional uh, side. You know, going through divorce, uh, having full, full custody of my kids, and you know, you program certain uh, differently than than most as a family man. And now I find myself alone in this area. So then I started being negative of myself. All that talk, uh, it was really hard to to let go of all that and deprogram um, my brain and purify my brain and then also my body. So it took me probably like year two of practicing on a regular consistency, uh, in a regular basis, uh, at least three or four times a week. Then when everything clicked on the uh, yoga, you know, then the breathing came in place, the movement, the meditation and the positive talk, yeah. forgiving myself, loving my body, and it's okay to be selfish and start taking care of yourself. Yeah. When you watch these young guys in the NBA now, um, especially those who are immigrants, you know, I mean, you could use Luca as an example, who have done kind of the same thing, right? They've left their cultures and their family and friends and their countries. Um, and they've replanted themselves here and they're going like all the way in with their bodies and their time and their mind. What do you well, think? I'm not sure Luca is a good example. I think that he's been playing professionally since he was like 14. So they rolled a red carpet for him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it is tough to leave, but he left Slovenia to Spain. I mean, he's traveled the world and um, and he's very skilled too. <laughs> he's one of the uh, those the, those type of players come, you know, every fifty years. He's mm -hmm. breaking all the records and all that. But anyways, uh, but there's so many athletes like myself that um, leave the country out of necessity mm -hmm. and comes here really looking for the American dream, and it's not easy. Uh, some of us don't speak English. We don't know anything about the culture. We're really lonely with nobody around or the new team, uh, your teammates. And sometimes you need a break from them. 
<laughs> but I think that um, that's where I get involved with, with them and I talk to them, I try to coach them more so than anything and, and try to just be a uh, sounding board. A lot of times they don't really necessarily need the help, they just need somebody to listen to them and guide them and, and, and literally tell them like, just be patient because the reward will come later. And it takes a lot of dedication, discipline, hard work, but eventually when, uh, when you make something out of yourself, then becomes uh, something really real and, and nice. <laughs> And special, yeah. You mentioned going through periods of time that felt really lonely, especially when you were just here and in it. Um, and I'm wondering if that has inspired you to reach down and do all of the mentoring and the guiding and the coaching that you do, because you do a lot of it. I, I see it all over Instagram. I'm like, man, this guy is everywhere, but you really do reach over and try to mentor young men. And, and girls, or yeah. women. Yeah. Having two daughters has, has been kind of refreshing, um, especially right now, nowadays, I think women are gonna take over the world <laughs> until oh, everyone. You heard and it I'm, here. Not being, I'm not being biased because <laughs> I have two girls that are super talented and smarter than my boys for sure. <laughs> and they work harder too. <laughs> Well, but we do I, tend to have to work harder. <laughs> that's not a, that's not breaking news. <laughs> but I do uh, I, I do a lot in my my home country. I think that at least we are role models, whether we want it or not. And you know, you can take advantage and, and kind of change someone's life, or you can decide to isolate yourself. So uh, the the loneliness, I think that I. I gather, and that's the reason I got involved with all these coaching and camps in Mexico and throughout the world, because it fulfilled and I needed to be around others that wanted to learn the game of basketball. And, and you know, I, I got so much knowledge from so many coaches that I, it's my, my job to kind of spread that knowledge in my industry around the world. But now with the girls, I'm kind of carrying my time to, especially my youngest. My youngest is a great athlete. Uh, she had a basketball game the other day. She scored 14 points, <laughs> all the points in her team, which it reminds me of me. I'm not saying that she's gonna have a pro <laughs> basketball career, but why not? Yeah. And she's willing to learn. Uh, and that's that's the key, you know, when, when you go to this, um, basketball camps and, and coaches clinics and when you talk to these foreigners, if they're willing to listen and willing to, to adapt and, and really apply what they're learning from me, I have no problem coaching them and, and teaching them uh, so they can you know, have a better career than me. Hmm. Uh, I'm gonna have you pick a card. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, it's not a tarot card, it's not very scary at all. It's you got all these to choose from. Just choose one and read the question and answer it honestly. Who or what defines the contents of my life? Let's switch. Go. Ah, nope. You're stuck with that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting one for you. Very interesting. Who or what defines the contents of my life? Who, I mean, obviously, we got to talk about parents, yeah. parenting. Uh, my parents, I don't even think they finish uh, elementary. Yeah. They know how to read and write. <laughs> Out of Mexico, you know, at a young age, you have to go to work early. Uh, big families, of course. But with that said, you know, I'm proud of them because there's seven of us and they really, uh, taught us values and fundamentals. And I can tell you stories, many, many stories. Uh, one story that, that really resonates with me is my father. One time I went to the store and he bought some stuff and the man made a mistake on the total bill. So I kind of read, and this is when I'm like maybe 
10 years and when I'm getting into math and all that, it was a few items. So we left and I told my dad, I was like, dad, I don't, I don't think that's right. You know, they didn't charge you for this. And he took me back to teach me a lesson. Mm. And he went and paid back, paid for the, uh, the mistake that the men mm. made, which I thought it was brilliant. Cause then I was like, wow, my dad, knowing that he needs money, knowing that he has to feed so many people, it's a good lesson to learn. When it comes to my mother, super humble, uh, spiritual, dragged me to church every Sunday <laughs> and literally dragged me and my brothers. But uh, it also showed me discipline, consistency, because mm. she was always there, always, always, always. And that was her community. Mm. And I didn't want to be part of it at a young age, but ultimately it really defined those values. Same with my dad, working hard all the time, providing for seven, seven uh, children in the family, uh, never left us. We never needed anything. We had a roof on our heads. We had food on the table. We had to kind of fight for the clothes and shoes and all that. Uh, <laughs> and being the youngest of seven, I usually got like, you know, the worn out shoes and clothes. But anyways, to me, that's, that's uh, the values that I learned and, and, and that's what defines my life nowadays because I was fortunate enough to get an education, uh, not only that, to learn another language and literally take the lifestyle they show me to a whole different level and provide better opportunities for my kids. I think that's um, part of what a lot of people don't understand about immigrants in this country or in other places, but namely in the US. And my parents are immigrants and they always tell my sisters and me, we just want a better life for you. That's why we ended up here. That's why we stayed here. We didn't go back to a situation that you know would have been far different for you. And if you want to talk about a shift, uh, there was one particular scenario. I'm 17, I'm already playing really good basketball in Mexico. I got offers to go professional in the Mexican league, so I'm in Europe. And I was intrigued about learning English. And I wanted to come to the US because I knew that the best basketball was in the US. My mother said no. Mm. And I had to literally rebel a little bit against my mom and compromise as well. Because she's like, you're the youngest of the family, I don't want you leaving. And her idea of the U.S. was liberals, uh, drugs, alcohol. Hmm. And I'm like, mom, this is a great opportunity. And she's like, okay, I will let you go with one condition. You have to promise me that you finish up school. I have to promise that. And it's the reason I didn't come out to the MBA draft early, because I wanted to finish my degree at the University of Oklahoma. But the shift came when my father, on the other hand, is not saying anything. Hmm. And he takes me to the bus station to take the bus to the border. And he was always very frugal <laughs> with his money. And get to the bus station, hands me a couple hundred bucks. And he says, I don't ever want to see you again. Hmm. I'm 17 and I'm like, wow. Do you know what to think? And surely he wanted to communicate something, but he just couldn't communicate properly. I got on the bus, cried my whole way. And I said, oh, there's no way going back. So whatever it was, whether it was basketball, school, I knew I had to succeed. What's that was your... a shift. And it was a positive <laughs> shift because I took it differently. I didn't take it as my father didn't, doesn't want me. Eventually we, we kind of talk about it and, and that's what he explained. He's like, look, I just didn't want you to fail. I want you to stay there. Not because I don't want you back, it's because I wanted you to prove who you are and, and get a better life. Yeah. What, what's really, your... Go ahead. Yeah, what's your relationship with them now? It's great. Yeah. It's always been great. Um, 
I've never been needy. I was spoiled, obviously, growing up since I was well, a baby. Well, that's the youngest. <laughs> Very spoiled, apparently. Uh, but now I get to spoil them based on my success and my financial stability. Uh, but that was a, a, a positive shift. And I had this conversation with multiple people because a lot of us, we, we, uh, we want excuses to do the wrong thing. Hmm. And it's because, oh yes, I was traumatized by my mom or my father. Don't get me wrong, we, a, lot of, a lot of us go through trauma early in our early years. But it's how you take that and if you convert it into a positive energy moving forward rather than using it as an excuse to blame someone. And that's what I did. And eventually I cleared out with my father. But, you know, that's my biggest fear with my kids. And, you know, I don't want to, I don't want them to all of a sudden have an, a, an excuse to not go to school or not to work or whatever it is. So I've tried to be mindful of my words with my children and ev everyone else because they're so powerful. Yeah. Do you say that what you took from your parents and your father is kind of reflected in your kids. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And my father was one of those tough guys, uh, tough love. <laughs> and I'm so different. Everything that I was lacking, not necessarily that I don't do what my parents did, I still kind of teach those values and fundamentals to my kids. But the lack or the things that I didn't get from them, which was, you know, that love and, and care I do with my kids. But I have to be careful, too, because if you love them too much, <laughs> then they, they don't do much in life. Hmm. What is that saying? Uh, Giving give enough to do something, but not, not a lot to do nothing. Hmm. I don't know. Hmm. I is there before. a career goal that you still have that you are wrapping your mind around? Do you have goals that you still want to achieve? So many goals. Luckily, I'm, I'm young enough, youngish still. Definitely. <laughs> but my, my goal number one right now is in my priorities is health. Yeah. Is health after a, a long career, all the injuries, four knee surgeries, two abdomen surgeries, three back surgeries, two hip surgeries. I was talking to you guys, I broke all my fingers, my feet broke my toes, uh, forehead broken, almost lost my, my vision, my right eye. So all of that kind of caught up with me in my 40s. Okay. <laughs> so my priority changed. Uh, I had uh, another goal that I had was obviously to be still in, in, in the NBA environment as a, an executive or as a head coach. But I put everything on hold for two particular reasons, health and family. Hmm. Uh, because I, I started seeing, okay, I'm spending a lot of time coaching a lot of kids. And, and you know, I have full custody of my kids, so I have to dedicate most of my time to them because I find myself spending so much time coaching other young adults and other uh, foreigners trying to get to the NBA that I started feeling like I was dropping the ball with my kids, especially mm. when they came into the teenage years. Mm. Then I had to like, you know what? Have to concentrate on them now. And require right now, a little more attention. Absolutely. Yeah. And right now, uh, still those goals. Uh, I want to get back into the NBA, uh, be a head coach or run a team in the future. Uh, I also want to not get involved in politics, but I want to go back to my country and, and do some good for basketball in Mexico. And I feel like sports galvanizes an entire country. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of a cool thing um, to utilize a game to bring people together and you know teach these values and fundamentals that we talk about. I look forward to witnessing you achieve all of these goals. All right, thank you for joining us today. I'm Sonia Zad. We'll see you next time on The Shift. Hey, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share.
This podcast is made possible by our friends at the Center for Integrative Counseling and Psychology. The center provides counseling for children, teens, and adults in offices across North and Central Texas and online. They also offer psychological evaluations for kids and adults to help determine issues like ADHD to help you reach your potential in school, work, and life. Through counseling at the center, you can gain insight, learn, grow, and build skills to live your best life emotionally and in your relationships. They accept most major insurance plans and work to make it easy to set up counseling to get you on track to achieve your goals. Their therapists care, share their expertise, and guide you in navigating life as well as transforming your life. Check them out at www.thecentercounseling.org. Tell them we sent you. The Center, Counseling for Life Transformation, Counseling for Insight and Growth.